my colleague across the Solway, uh, Naomi Kay, who is the uh, manager at the Solway Coast Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. So we do a lot of partnership working together. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have joined these webinars before, but we started doing them last winter um, because we weren't able to get together in person. So we weren't able to hold our normal joint uh, conference that we would normally do. Um, and as the webinars have actually been really successful and really popular, um, we decided that we'd start again in the winter um, to give people a chance to kind of learn a bit more about the other topics that are coming up. So again, bear with us if uh, we have any technical issues, but hopefully everything will go smoothly. And if you do want to know anything else about either of our organisations, then you can uh, just feel free to visit our websites. It's very kind of just Google uh, Solby Forth Partnership or Solby Coast AONB, and you can see about um, all the different projects that we're involved in. And one of the projects that we've actually been discussing more recently is actually trying to hold a cross-border archaeology project. And this webinar is really part of that um, kind of getting that started and sparking the interest. So if any of you are interested in archaeology um, sites uh, specifically on either side of the Solway, or you would like to get involved in any kind of community archaeology project, then please do get in touch or drop something into the chat. So we'll make a note of it or email us through our websites. That'd be great to find out. Um, and I'll just pass you on to Naomi. Just to add to that as well, any any of you who um, maybe know about something along the coast, you're not quite sure what it is, maybe a little feature of some kind, if you're, you know, in your community or um, that we'd like to know, you'd like to know a bit more about or if it might be something of interest, then let us know because part of the project will be about looking at some of the features that we don't know an awful lot about and trying to do some survey work or some research or even some excavation to try and find out what they might be. Um, so um, sort of archaeological mysteries, so, so to speak. So. Um, be good. Okay, so I'm um, just going to do run through the technicalities. Apologies to those who um, have been on these webinars before and know how it works, but um, this is for the benefit of those who might be new to it. So um, we're running this on a um, on Zoom on a webinar function, so it's different to your normal kind of meetings, um, full meetings. So it just means as participants, um, your camera and your video are automatically switched off. So unfortunately, you can just see us, and you will see the speakers in a minute. Um, you can still participate, like some of you have been doing already. There's a chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, it means you can post comments and observations to anyone on the web, everyone on the webinar. So just feel free to use that. Um, click on it, and it'll bring up the chat window, and you can kind of type into it. Uh, only thing to remember is that if you're posting a comment, just make sure that you select the option "All Panelists and Attendees" because it sometimes defaults to "All Panelists," um, and it means your comments will be seen by everyone, which would be nice. But we've also um, probably you'll find that next to the chat window, a questions and answers uh, button or option. Uh, if you've got questions for the speakers, which we would really encourage, please just post those in the Q&A section on that button. And then at the end, we'll choose some of those and we'll hopefully get uh, some of them answered um, at the end by the speakers. So do feel free to post a question there. Um, this session is currently being live streamed uh, on Facebook and recorded as well. So welcome to our Facebook um, ob ob observators. Ob ob yeah, I can't remember uh, what the word is, but you know what I mean. Um, it will be available in due course on both the Solo Firth Partnership and the AOMB YouTube channels as well. So you can watch it again. Um, it now uh, it's now down to introduce our two speakers, who are Mark Graham and uh, Mark Graham and Graham Cavers. Uh, too many Grahams in there for me. Um, so Mark's going to talk first. He's a project manager at Grampus Heritage and Training. Uh, in addition to international work, Mark has coordinated several fieldwork projects in Cumbria, including the four-year Discovering Deventio Roman project at Pat Castle, which is near Cockermouth. Uh, and he's also coordinated lots of walkover surveys, geophysical surveys and also excavations related largely to the monastic landscape of Home Culture Abbey in Abbey Town, just on the edge of Solway Coast A and B. Our second speaker is Graham, who is director at AOC Archaeology Group and the company's head of survey and geomatics, which is a fabulous title. He has a long-standing research interest in the later prehistoric archaeology of Northern Britain and has coordinated numerous large area surveys, as well as excavations at key sites, and this is where my pronunciation is going to go, so I'll say that now, such as Colts Lock, Black Lock of Merton, and at the Clactol Brock in Assint. <laughs> that wasn't very good uh, there, so that I've tried. 
Uh, Mark's going to start off right now, so I'm going to hand over to him and just let him switch on his sound and his camera, um, and then we'll disappear and let him do his talk. Let's hope he's still there. Aha! <laughs> right, off you go, Mark. Right, we're off. Good evening, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I'm going to present some of our work on the, the Cumbrian side of the Solway and some of our archaeology work with um, community volunteers. And to start off, I am going to change my slide. No, seamless. How did you do it before, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> he has done this already. <laughs> okay. Mark, if you just make sure your cursor is actually on you've actually clicked on the presentation, so then you'll be moving the presentation. Let's try and start it again. Yes, right, we're off. So I would like to start by, um, talking about a project we did discovering Deventio some years ago and we actually worked on a site called Borough Walls which is near Workington and here you can see Workington on the Solway. Um, Borough Walls site, the Roman site on the frontier defences is here and uh, the River Derwent comes down here and currently meets the sea in more or less a straight line but in the Roman period it's thought that actually Siddic Pond here was uh, the course of the river. So we wanted to have a look at the Roman site with geophysics uh, that had never been done before. Uh, but as you'll see, we actually ended up doing a bit of prospection uh, and finding something quite different. If you aren't familiar with geophysics, this is uh, Roger doing resistance on that site at Workington. He's using a resistance meter which puts electricity into the ground and we measure the resistance to the current, which can be affected by archaeological remains. And here you can see Jay and John using our twin gradiometer system. Uh, so these instruments are measuring the very fine changes in magnetism above the ground. It's a passive system which can also be impacted by archaeological features in the ground. Uh, the Roman site wasn't that interesting, to be honest. Uh, we knew it was there. Here you can see um, the lines of three ditches. Uh, very little detail in the interior. No obvious gates, no roads, no settlement outside. And equally, the resistance data um, again confirms the ditches, but really added very little to our understanding of the site. Uh, we did quite a lot of work around um, in the fields we had access to, and again, nothing much of interest, but we had spare time. And having worked down here on the old sea cliff, um, Looking back up the hill, there's this lovely plateau at the top behind, just behind Siddiq. So we, we asked the farmer, he said, by all means, have a look. So we went up there and totally on prospection, we didn't know there was any archeology span there, but you can see some really interesting results here in the magnetometry. See an enclosure, with an entrance, and you can see one, two, three circular features with trackways leading up to the plateau. The resistance backs this up, you can see here, um, the double ditches of the circular enclosure. Unfortunately, it has a reservoir built on it now. And you can also see one of the cairns. So from going to look at a Roman site, what we think we have found potentially is a prehistoric enclosure and associated burials, possibly a henge type structure. We haven't put a spade in the ground there yet, but I just wanted to start uh, with this information to show you the potential of geophysics to identify new sites and, and this particular one we would love to go back and have a look at it. I was asked to talk a little bit about other techniques and probably the simplest but 
really good way of engaging people is through walkover survey. Um, here you can see Ray and Pat measuring a cairn field. So it's just a process of getting out and about, um, recording what you see and putting dots on a map. It can be quite difficult. It's not always sunny. Uh, this is Ray losing his welly on the salt marsh survey. And that's actually an Naomi there. Um, and we can have some quite long days in the field, um, but it's fun and you never quite know what you're going to find. This is a reference from Collingwood and Granger related to the Monastery of Home Culture and that tells us that the monastery actually had 21 salt pans in operation between Ang Angerton and Border along the Solway coast and that they had access to peat as a fuel um, to evaporate the brine. So using that, um, we decided to have a walkover survey and systematically walk the salt marsh in that area and record everything that we found. Um, this is just an example. So a walkover survey identifies any historic landscape feature, any archaeological site. Uh, you don't have to fully understand it, um, but it gives us a location and gives us some information about it. If I was to sit here and talk only about salt sites for half an hour, you'd see a lot of confused people in gorse bushes. Um, they're not always very photogenic and they're not always very easy to understand. Um, However, something that's a bit easier to understand were the bridges. And this really was a surprise because um, these bridges were not acknowledged at all as important landscape features. Um, and yet there they were, two still being used. And we think that these big sandstone slab clapper bridges are monastic. Um, here's another one, three big slabs. They weren't all very easy to record. Um, lots of them have been reused, some of them underwater, some of them under mud. Um, but they tell us a lot about the connectivity in the landscape and how the monastery was um, transporting goods and people across the marshes. Here is one which is still on a footpath, still in use. Um, all of the features are measured, recorded. We have feature recording sheets and in this case, a very artistic um, volunteer called Ian does, does illustrations for us. Um, now, I was presenting these bridges at a, at a conference and Alistair, who Alistair Brock from Natural England was present, who used to manage Wedden Flow here. And we know that the, um, the monastery had access to peat for salt production. Newton Harlosh was a big salt producing site. And Alistair said he thinks he's seen one of these bridges, very similar to what I was presenting from the salt marsh. So he took me out um, and showed me the location and this is what we found on the edge of Wedham. It doesn't look much but we could see sandstone there and so we had a day out with our volunteers cleaning up and very satisfactorily um, this also turns out to be a three slab sandstone clapper bridge and we think this is related to the mon monastic access to the peat to evaporate brine for salt making. So that was a very satisfying result. On to excavation then, which is um, obviously one of our main methods of understanding um, archaeology. And this is home culture at Abbey Town. So what you see there is the, the nave of the Abbey Church, which is now the parish church. And this particular trench was targeting the cloister and the west end of the chapter house. Now, excavation is a great way of getting people involved in in archaeology, in history, um, in uncovering their own past. We can work with volunteers of all ages, abilities, different interests. There's always a job to do on an excavation site and it actually is always great fun. Um, the work I'm presenting now is the work of our volunteers, but just to give you a few highlights. Um, this was particularly unusual because it's a, a capped drain that hasn't been robbed out. And at the end of the line of the drain here, you can see a small arch, this turned out to be a water system. Uh, so this is a totally intact piece of, of medieval um, archeology. span We were able to excavate the system, take lots of soil samples out of the fill. And after we've excavated, of course, an essential part is to produce our plans, which we draw and then we digitize. And this is like a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that helps us to piece together the whole monastic complex. We also draw sections, the vertical sections. Um, so this is the entrance to the cistern. All of this soil that filled it was sampled. And I'll come back to some of that later. 
Digging at Abbey Town is varied. Um, it's varied because of the state of preservation. There, there's no natural building stone on the Solway Plain. So um, stone was very valuable. And we know that the sandstone from the monastery was robbed or recycled, depending how you look at it, to put into other local farmhouses. And what you're looking at there is actually a wall, which I've nicely highlighted. But this is the, um, the west end of the chapter house. It's good enough for us in a way because all of the stone is gone, but it, again, it's another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. This shows us where the chapter house wall was. Uh, we had some very nice grave slabs. We didn't disturb any burials, but um, this particular one um, relates to Lady Ewa de Newton, which would be from West Newton, not Newton. This is a much better preserved trench. This was um, what we call the infirmary's lodging, but this building was lived in quite late. And there's Billy in the trench with his turkeys. Um, very nicely preserved hearth here. You can see the fire affected clay. Um, and if you compare this to the, the chapter house trench I was showing you, you can see that this, this really survives just below the sod. Uh, this is the cistern here, which the function of that was to flush the latrine one function, which is here. It had a partition, it had a fire, and we interpret this as the infirmary's lodging. Having dug at Abbey Town for 10 years, we heard a lot about the tunnel, uh, lots of legends of tunnels in archaeology. Um, finally, we found it, and this is the main drain, and it would have been high enough to walk through uh, when, you, when it was full height and still capped. Um, but it, it ra raises another question. Every good dig has questions raised afterwards and what we don't understand is where is the source of the water that was coming down this drain and through the infirmary but we were able to establish that this masonry here on mill grove is actually a medieval wall because this wall line carries right through here again we interpret this as being part of the infirmary structure one of our more recent digs um, targeted again using geophysics initially, targeted the rear daughter, which is the latrine, and the east end of the chapter house, because we wanted to pin down the eastern end of the cloister. And here from the air, you can see a tale of two very different buildings. The chapter house here almost completely robbed out, and yet the rear daughter here actually surviving very well. This is the latrine pit here, which as you can see, when excavated, um, it is robbed, it is damaged, but uh, remarkably still in good condition and some stone left for us. So these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, uh, you can see some of them in place at the top. That's great. We, we learned a lot about the cloister, but we wanted to um, do some prospection further down the field, quite away from the, the main cloister. And you can see the results there. This is in low lying land, um, but we just wanted to have a look. We know the Abbey Mill was at Millgrove. And the results, as you can see, um, you have this very dark band uh, running through a highly magnetic anomaly. Um, and there's a gap in it here. So we wanted to understand what this was and we targeted the gap and we found this, which is the edge of a channel. All these deposits here dipping down in the silt. So we were on the edge of a water course. That's great, there was medieval material in here. At the other end of the trench, though, we started to find stonework. Why is there stone in the silt? Um, couldn't be a house. Was it related to the mill? Um, it was nicely built. And as we carried on, we found the timbers. And this was one of those light bulb moments where you're standing in a field where there's no water, really, apart from the groundwater. And you realise that this was a wharf, that home culture had its own wharf. They were bringing vessels up and very, very close to the Abbey. And I remembered working at a site of St. Christian's Chapel um, some years ago and watching the tide coming up, the waver from Skimbernest, and logs were flowing upstream. So suddenly this all made sense. They could unload vessels at Skimbernest, they could bring these vessels, shallow draft barges, all the way up to the Abbey, to this wharf, and that is how home culture, and all of this sandstone, that's how it came to be here, it's how it was possible transport the stone, but also tells us an awful lot about how the monastery was connected to the Solway and um, how it could trade goods in and out. It was a transformative discovery. 
Dendrochronology is very useful. We cut our sample, we sent it to Queen's University Belfast, and we have a felling date after 1167. Uh, we didn't have sapwood, unfortunately, but that's great. I mean, Home Culturum established 1150 by the monks of Melrose. But we wanted to do more. And so we started the Home Culturum Harbour project and we went and we carried on from where our trench was at the jetty to see what happened with the timbers. And as you can see, the wharf frontage does carry on. Um, we have a big beam here tied into the bank with these cross pieces. Um, and there you can see from above. So good timber preservation in the silt, very difficult trench to dig. You can see this, we like to keep vertical sections in archeology, span this was impossible. Uh, the sides of the trench just come towards you sometimes. So we had to batter the sides of the trenches. But on close inspection, the timbers started to give up some secrets. You can see the timber sits on a sandstone base underneath which is river gravel, which is a great relief after you've been working in silt all day. Um, but this stone here is packing a notch which is cut into the underside of the timber. And you wouldn't do that uh, to use it in this position. But more obviously, you can see these holes here. And we realised that this is a reused, it's a repurposed timber beam. It's actually a wall plate from a timber building. So this would have stood at the top of the wall. Um, it's jointed underneath for supports. And these holes are for uh, the uprights, the staves or sails for weaving a wattle panel. So you weave around it. That was fantastic. Um, we realised also that um, the cross pieces tying the, the wharf into the bank also had running notches which means that these are upright posts also from a timber building with wattle panels and these are for, for locking the willow into the, the post. The dendro dates, we now had four samples, dendro chronology at Queen's Belfast and David Brown produced this and a great report. These are the last dates of the tree rings. So we have 1177, 1176, 1175 and 1169, but we don't have sapwood. That means that we don't know the exact felling date, but the, the date ranges are so close that we can conclude that these trees were felled to make this timber building um, in the latter half of the 12th century, soon after the establishment of home culture. The last surprise is that David Brown quite confidently says it's likely that three of these timbers came from Scotland. Um, this is a great forum to, to show this data being at Solway wide project. Um, that's because when, when you have a dendro sample, they compare it to baseline data. And um, David was finding that the best match by far for three of our timbers was from Scotland. And he uses a range of, of sites, one of which is Kerlav Rock Castle, and there are a few others. But that's fantastic and fascinating. An aerial shot to show you just orientation. So here's the, the rear door to the, the Abbey Church here, the cloister here and our harbour, our wharf and jetty, all the way down here. Um, so we digitise our plans, and we put the pieces of the jigsaw together. Um, so now you can see um, each one of these is a wall or the foundation of a wall we've seen, and we can add our river channel and our wharf in, into the map. And of course, um, we want to share this information. We have a very talented volunteer, Ian Thompson, who took all of this information, these archaeological plans, and produced this fantastic illustration of our harbour there, and iron working, and uh, the Abbey Mill. The finds, of course, we have a lot of fantastic finds, um, floor tiles, a uh, nice axe head from the harbour. Um, I've shared this because it's quite an enig enigmatic object. This is a, an intaglio or seal matrix. Um, showing a, a carved bearded head with a sort of crown. Uh, we haven't had this fully assessed yet. I like to think it could represent the head of John the Baptist, but a nice object. We have a lot of pottery, but the more interesting pieces to us are often the late medieval or early post-medieval pottery, because that helps tell us which parts of the monastery carried on being used after dissolution. Uh, we thought this was graffiti at first, and I was looking at these initials DN, um, thinking about, um, is it an abbreviation for Latin, and it's in a sun in splendour? But then we thought, well, if it's a mould or a stamp, you have to reverse it. So if you reverse it, it actually becomes RC, and those are the initials of Robert Chambers, who was the abbot of home culture 
um, and famously built the porch on the end of the abbey there. So, lots of other finds, too many to go into detail, but it's, it's exciting material. We have a pilgrim badge, lots of stained glass, book clasps, and I like to think the best collection of tokens from a monastic site in Britain, but let's confidently say the north of England. Um, these have been looked at by Kate Rennix and, and um, research is ongoing into those, but they're fantastic. The samples that we took out of the cistern are processed, they're flotted, and they revealed a lot of gravel, which had a lot of fish bone in it. So we spent a, um, a long time in Silleth Library. These are our keen volunteers uh, picking fish bones out of gravel. Um, it might sound dull, but actually it's quite therapeutic. And the information is valuable. It helps us to piece together the species that were being um, utilized at the Abbey. Uh, including freshwater. So freshwater species like carp show evidence of aquaculture um, and everybody there can now identify the dermal denticle of a thornback ray at 100 yards, I think. We have post-ex workshops where we sort the material we found um, in the Abbey Church itself. Uh, this is Megan helping us um, process the finds ready for archiving and it's great to be able to bring these finds back into the Abbey Church and engage the community and work together to, to sort through and assess the material. I think I'm about out of time, but I just want to end on this last site. We're going to go back to the Romans. Um, it starts with a field, as it often does, and this is Bowness on Solway, and that is the back of the graveyard. So the church wanted to extend their, um, their graveyard, and to do that, we know that they were near the Roman fort of Maya, which lies at the western end of Hadrian's Wall. We wanted to extend across here, so we did a geophysics. Uh, for research, for interest, and we had this amazing result. This is magnetometry first. Uh, you can see these um, white rectangles here, um, evidence of burning. That's all archaeology. But the resistance meter, exactly the same field, shows something quite different. This is the resistance data from the same field, and you can see these very dark, high resistance bands. So why are both instruments from the same field showing such different information? If I draw around the high resistance anomalies in red and superimpose that onto the magnetometry data, you can see that actually the resistance is showing the roads, the street pattern, and the magnetometry is showing the buildings. So what we found there was a, a significant part, a previously unknown part of the Roman vicus at Bonus on Solway, the, the civilian settlement. Um, we want to do more work on this. We want to build on it. The church were not allowed to extend the graveyard, unfortunately, but the community support and interest was really strong. So we are developing the Bowness on Solway Community Archaeology Project uh, to extend our geophysics across the route of Hadrian's Wall here, uh, where Hadrian's Wall meets the coast. This is the Solway coast. We want to map the extent of the, the Roman activity here. Um, from the settlement, see how it relates to the frontier defences, and also try and answer this outstanding research question of what happens to the vallum. It's currently only known up to this point. Using geophysics, using survey, we think we'll be able to tell if it turns, if it just ends. Um, so that's the bonus on Solway Community Archaeology Project, and that's one for the future. That's the end of my talk. This is my last slide. And I'm now seamlessly going to hand over to Graham Cavers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Let's see how seamless we can make this. <laughs> um, okay. Hopefully that's working now, everyone. Um, I'll rely on somebody to shout out if they can't see my screen. Um, but yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give you a perspective from the other side of the Solway, from the Dumfries and Galloway side on the north coast. Um, and I'll be talking a bit about some of the survey projects that I've been involved with um, alongside some community groups and uh, you know other organisations uh, on the Scottish side of the border. Um, looking at some of the archaeology in that area. 
So I just want to um, kind of uh, preface my talk um, just by saying a little bit about what survey is and you know why we do these kind of things. And Mark's already shown you some of the great results you can get from prospection type survey and geophysics and how that information really helps um, guide the strategy for archaeological projects. Um, so obviously, finding archaeology and detecting it is a root big, is a major reason for doing this this kind of work. Um, but also increasingly we we look at survey as a way of um, of creating records and documenting sites um, largely because there's there's much more awareness now of the um, the threat that, that many of our archaeological sites face so um, particularly in the face of things like coastal erosion and climate change um, gathering this kind of baseline data and information about sites that could potentially be damaged <clears throat> in future years as, as um, their circumstances change is, is more and more important. So this element of documentation and baseline recording is really fundamental to what um, we do when we're surveying. Um, and lastly, um, but perhaps most importantly, it's about understanding our archaeology better and um, collecting information that helps us you know, guide our, our research designs for, um, for asking the right questions about these sites and, and how we can appreciate them better. And also sharing that information. So survey is a very good way of co collecting information that can be used to, um, to inform others and present sites um, to the, the wider public. So one of the first things I'll say is just um, <clears throat> we're very lucky, um, as are many areas of the UK, but particularly in, in southwest Scotland, where we have um, the availability of the government's LIDAR data. This is the aerial laser scanning data set, um, which has been made freely available to, um, to anyone, um, but which is particularly useful to archaeologists for obvious reasons. So we're able to work with these really high resolution three dimensional data sets um, for the landscape and over much of Dumfries and Galloway. And you can see in this map, which is taken from the Scottish Remote Sensing Portal, um, that the coverage for Dumfries and Galloway is getting close to 100% now. You know, there's very uh, uh, few areas um, of the region that are not covered by this, this high resolution data. So that gives us all sorts of opportunities and new avenues of, of going about this kind of um, research and this kind of recording project. And the first of these that I'll talk about was um, the Mackers Waterborne project, which is just coming to its end now. Um, and the timing in some ways was really good. Uh, if there was anything good to come out of a global pandemic was that um, this project was designed um, for people to take part in um, from their own homes, really. So uh, making use of this LIDAR data set, we, were, we put online uh, an interactive uh, map. Um, so it presents the, the, the three-dimensional LIDAR data, this high-resolution um, 3D terrain modelling, alongside historic maps and the known archaeology sites um, uh, for the Mackers. And, and basically, it was kind of a citizen science project where we invited our participants to contribute things that they could see in this data and add them to a data set that we could then filter through and, 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 um, and work out targets for further survey and further research. So all of these sort of dots that you can see on this map here on the uh, on the left, oh, sorry, on the right hand side, all of these orange dots were contributed by users to the project. So people sitting at home browsing this map and whenever they thought they could find something that didn't look like it had been recorded in the sites and monuments record, they could pin it and add it to the map. Um, and that was the basis for our future um, recording uh, projects. So following that, we were out in the field, again, using some of the techniques that, that Mark's already talked about, field walking, um, just visiting these sites on the ground to identify whether what um, we could see on the ground and what was really there equated to what was visible in the LIDAR data. And thereafter, um, producing these kind of interpreted plans, these kind of measured drawings, um, which are kind of like a simplified way of conveying um, what, the, what the survey team um, observe on the ground. Um, and also alongside that, using some more sort of high tech methods, um, this is a gradiometry survey, again, similar to the type that Mark's described and shown you already, um, but using this technique to kind of add to um, the features that are visible above ground and just see the extents of some of these sites. So I had lots of really good results from that. This is just one example. Um, this is a, as a chunk of 3D terrain um, taken from this uh, government LIDAR data set. 
Um, and this is, you know, on the, re the raised beach, the West Mackers raised beach area. And you can see um, overlaying our geophysics results onto that kind of shelf of raised beach, you can see um, very clearly the, the ploughed out remains of the, um, the, this, the defences of this late prehistoric enclosure here. So this is a site that was known, uh, was first documented by the Ordnance Surveys um, first edition map, um, but subsequently damaged by agriculture and more or less ploughed out, not visible in aerial photographs or anything. So this new data set um, working with the three-dimensional data and this high resolution geophysics really giving us lots of information about um, a site that's, you know, that more or less been lost to the records previously. And the other thing about um, uh, using these techniques is that we're, we're able to compile lots of, uh, you know, detailed and new information about sites which are potentially at risk. So this example sits right on the, the west coast facing the, you know, the storms rolling in from the, from the Irish Sea. So it is at risk, it's actively eroding and parts of it are being washed away every year. So uh, um, good to compile this kind of baseline data about these sites before they're lost. So the Mackers Waterborne project, uh, you know, compiled lots and lots of new information. Um, once the, the process of filtering out some of the false positives and some of the misleading um, features that looked like archaeology, we're, we're still left with well over 200 new archaeological sites contributed to, um, to the sites and monuments record for the Mackers. So um, this encompassing, you know, a really wide range of things from prehistoric hut circles, like uh, Bronze Age hut circles, burnt mounds, right up to really quite substantial um, uh, upstanding monuments that had just completely escaped detection before. So this is a really nice example. This is a, um, a fort not far from Newton Stewart. Uh, and you can hopefully you can see in this slide the, um, the upstanding ramparts in a, a really quite densely forested area. And it just completely escaped detection before. So really quite impressive and valuable results contributing to our knowledge of the archaeology in the Southwest. The other thing that uh, this approach is able to do is it gives us information about areas that are really not easy to survey. Um, so we, we spent some time looking at um, uh, water bodies, so the lochs and um, drained uh, wetlands um, and marshy areas where archaeology is, is quite uh, abundant in southwest Scotland. We have many of these kind of cranogs and artificial islands um, that are built in these wetland locations in prehistoric, um, the late prehistoric period particularly. Um, but very difficult areas to survey, so not easy to, to compile good and reliable records um, without using a, a method of aerial, aerial survey. So these are just a couple of, of examples that were pulled out by, by volunteers. This, this is a known site in Mochram Loch, um, at Long Island, but you can see never really properly surveyed before, but um, you can see we're able to identify the upstanding uh, rectangular buildings on this island here. And at the other end of the spectrum, much more sort of ephemeral remains as well. You can see um, just by, but once you get your eye in and you learn how to read the topography in LIDAR data sets, you can see that this is the remains of a drained loch here. Um, and you can just see the, the, the surviving outline of that loch. Um, but just in at the edges of the, of the marsh area, you can hopefully just see in this slide a dark circle here. And that's the plowed down damaged remains of a cranog. Um, again, previously documented in the 19th century, but never seen since, and no surveyor since then has been able to locate it. So this new approach to um, using this high-res 3D data set um, has given us lots of new information about sites like this. And this is important because um, we're currently working on the wetland sites in, in Dumfries and Galloway, and including at this site at Black Lock of Merton, where we're getting fantastic levels of um, of preservation, you know, really fine grained resolution um, information about what was going on on a daily basis on, on this settlement. So this, this site dates to around about the late 5th century BC. Dendro, dendrochronology um, sort of tying that down to sort of decade scale. So getting really sort of high resolution information about that site, but but not so much information about the wider context. And that's what this LIDAR uh, survey is giving us. And it's also useful for putting sites in their physical context as well. So this is just an example of how we're able to use that 3D data to, um, to almost reconstruct the environments of that Black Lock settlement. So um, this is a, a, um, a kind of reconstruction using uh, a, an elevation 
um, of the flood level. So effectively reflooding the ground, which is now drained. And you can see when you do that, that our site is placed right on the edge of a deep area of, of loch deposits, um, which are now in sort of cultivated fields. So again, just using that sort of terrain modeling approach to understand the physical context of these sites. Another element, um, and again, um, uh, uh, looking at how survey gives us um, baseline information is um, a, a, a site that we just finished work on with um, the Whithorn Trust and volunteers associated with the trust there. Um, and this was done at uh, Chapel Finian, again on the west coast of the Mackers, just not far from, um, from Port William. And this was done as part of the um, Museum and Gallery Scotland's um, COP26 uh, Climate Change Conversations Fund. So this is about um, putting together baseline records of sites which could potentially be at risk of damage in the future if predict predictions of sea level uh, change are, um, are realised. So those of you who may have been there before, this is Chapel Finian right on the, on the west coast and right down by the shore, you can just see in this image here, um, the road on the other side of this, um, this dry stone dike here is really right next to the um, to the Irish Sea coast. So effectively, it wouldn't take much um, before storms and um, sea level change could start to really affect and damage um, the structural structure at Chapel Finian. Um, so this project was about uh, taking a group of volunteers, people who'd never actually done any uh, survey or recording before, and showing them simple techniques using photogrammetry. So this is this technique of using overlapping digital photographs to create 3D models. Um, and that's kind of, you know, in its own right is a useful thing to do to explain to people how simple it is to create these sort of detailed and, um, in, uh, and really sort of high resolution records. Um, but the products you get from it are really valuable for the purposes of management. And this, this slide here just shows you the, the kind of data set that comes from, um, from this kind of overlapping phot photographic technique. So you're able to see um, what we call the point cloud, these individual three-dimensional measurements uh, in this uh, uh, top left image here, um, provides us with a kind of stone by stone record of the structure and its condition. Um, and again, using uh, sort of techniques to texture that, we're able to um, produce a kind of very, um, very high resolution um, documentation of, of the, the physical condition of that site. So that's again just this element of how survey provides us with baseline records, uh, but it also forces us to ask ask questions about the site and um, and and how well we understand it. And as part of that project, we spent some time looking at um, similar chapels in the area, including um, this well known example at, at St Ninian's down at um, uh, the Isle of Whithorn, and again just comparing the sort of morphology of those. Um, uh, of those chapels and their uh, associated enclosures. And you can see by looking at the LIDAR data set here, we're able to pull out that um, there's there's two phases of enclosures at, um, at St. Ninian's Chapel. So we have this, the, the stone built one, which probably relates to um, a late phase of use, um, certainly well after 1300, um, but this overlies um, a much earlier um, circular or curvilinear um, enclosure, which may indicate, you know, the, um, a much earlier uh, phase of construction at this site. And most interestingly, um, associated with that enclosure and right next to it, you can see, hopefully just see the trace remains of a very faint ploughed down building there. Now, again, um, we don't know anything about this. This is, this is all purely survey work. There's no excavation being carried out here, but this is posing new research questions for sites like this. Um, what is this building? Does it post-date or does it even predate the, uh, the remains of St Ninian's Chapel that are visible there today? Um, it's notably on a similar east-west alignment, so you know I'm not going to stick my neck out too much, but it's very intriguing that structure and again something that, that we may well want to look at in more detail in the future. This is just a kind of isometric view of that 3D data. The, the current upstanding uh, St Ninian's Chapel itself, of course, uh, rebuilt in the 19th century, um, but you can see just the remains of this faint uh, structure, which may be something associated or predating it. So the other project I'll say a bit about uh, this evening is the Rins Revealed. Um, hopefully some of you uh, on, on this um, call will know um, a bit about this project already. Um, and uh, this is uh, about, this is going hand in hand with the development of um, 
of the Rins Coastal Path, so um, a walking route around the, um, the circumference of the, the Rins of Galloway, right on the extreme um, west coast of Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and so what uh, this project is looking to do is to, um, is, to, is to carry out surveys and conservation work and uh, investigation work designed to kind of enhance our understanding of, um, of the archaeology of the Rins, but also to involve people in recording and getting to grips with that archaeology and creating more of these kind of baseline records that help us understand and compare their condition um, going forward. So one example of our work here is down at the Mull of Galloway, right down at the very south, southern tip of the Rins uh, Peninsula. Um, this is just an aerial shot of, of the Mull itself. Um, but the reason this, uh, this site is important is because it's, it's the site of um, some really quite substantial earthworks, some really big sort of rampart style defences that are drawn across the neck of the, of the promontory. And these are very well known um, uh, features in, in the archaeology of the southwest of Scotland, but really not well understood. Um, so if they are what they appear to be, which is probably late prehistoric Iron Age um, type enclosures, then that makes the Mull of Galloway the, the largest Iron Age enclosure in the northern part of Britain. Um, so very significant monument, but but no significant work really been done there to help us understand what this thing is um, and, and when it dates to. And the other element of concern at the Mull is that um, these ramparts are being eroded away quite significantly. So there's, um, there's problems with uh, livestock erosion, but also their exposure to the elements down there where it's, it really does get battered by the wind and rain. So these areas of exposed archaeology are actively eroding and at risk of being lost. So part of our remit down there is to understand this site better, and um, but also to record it in such a way that we don't lose that information before it's gone. So this is yet another example of a, a geophysical survey and just to kind of um, highlight some of the results of this, the two major ramparts that I've been talking about run here across the neck of the mull um, and the other one just up here just out of the, um, the top of this image. Um, and so we carried out this gradiometry survey and um, uh, this magnetic technique that, that Mark's already spoken about um, to see if we could detect any archaeology within those two ramparts. And we were quite pleasantly surprised. These are quite noisy results, but not particularly um, unusual to get that sort of result um, in southwest Scotland. Um, but really quite impressive in terms of the number of features that we think are represented here. The first and most obvious is this big circular uh, probable enclosure here. So this is something that looks like um, a big timber stockaded enclosure um, right in the centre between these two massive, massive earthworks. Um, so it's kind of changing our uh, understanding of what the Mull of Galloway site is. And it could very well be that the important part of this site is not the, the promontory that's enclosed beyond the rampart, but actually about controlling um, the two beaches, the Tarbot, um, where the where boats could be drawn up um, either side of the of the mull itself. Um, so lots of archaeology to think about and get to grips with in the future there, um, and really might um, change our understanding of what this site is. Just a couple of uh, um, focus uh, features to point out to you, but you can see, again, the more you look at this data set, the more it starts to pop out. Um, hopefully you can see um, on your screens that there are some dark rings here and potentially some uh, rectangular structures as well. So it's very likely that we have archaeology from a number of, uh, of periods, probably spanning from late prehistory into the early medieval period. So really exciting stuff um, to get to grips with in the future. Another site that we've been working on with the Rins Revealed project is at Dune Castle. And again, this is a, is a really key site in, in Dumfries and Galloway. It's a, the remains of a broch or something broch-like, um, which is to say one of these monumental uh, dry stone towers that, that get built in Scotland from around about 400 BC onwards. Um, so this is really an, a, a quite impressive structure and, and not something that there's large numbers of in, in the southwest. These are sites that are much better known in areas like um, the Northwest Highlands and the Outer Hebrides, Orkney and Shetland. That's where you really get them most. So this is a really important sort of indicator of kind of cultural connections in, in the, the Iron Age period um, between uh, the southwest of Scotland and areas to the north. 
Um, so the plan at this site is to carry out consolidation conservation work and to present it a bit better to visitors. Um, and so one of the first um, jobs of our, our survey team was to get onto the site and create a detailed measured record. And that helps us um, plan the strategy for that conservation work, but also to understand and present the site better. <clears throat> and the results of that survey have been used um, to compile some uh, digital reconstructions of how this structure may have looked in prehistory when it was in use. So this, this kind of monumental tower enclosed within the remains of probably an earlier Iron Age um, promontory fort. Um, so again, just you making the most of this survey technique to help present these sites and communicate um, what they mean to the wider public. Another thing that um, our survey in the RINs has been, been doing is um, to look at the the the, um, the really diverse and uh, 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 complex archaeology that we find along um, the coastal areas itself. So um, monuments like uh, promontory forts relating to the Iron Age, but also uh, later um, archaeology from the medieval and post-medieval periods, often built in these really kind of inaccessible um, stack-like locations, so areas that are not easy to get to um, on, on the ground. And this is just an example at the Carlin House, which is a, a site which has possibly been suggested may have been a smuggler's shelter. There's a local tradition that there was, there was witches executed for witchcraft here and buried in the building. But it's an interesting site, um, whatever it may be, um, but difficult to get to on the ground. And we've been using techniques like drone and um, photogrammetry to create these three dimensional models and help um, extract the, um, the information about that site um, that helps us understand it better. Another example um, from a bit later uh, um, in time, this is a, an example of a mott, um, possibly with earlier um, origins as, as a prehistoric promontory fort. This is at Castle Ban. And again, using this sort of three-dimensional modeling technique to give us this really high resolution um, elevation model really helps um, uh, convey what the, the structure looks like on the ground. And again, in conjunction with some geophysical survey where we've investigated um, you know, what, what may be beneath the ground there, helping us understand these um, sites a bit better. In this case, you can see the, the white areas are, are stone or rubble, um, possibly indicating the, um, the presence of structures um, built on, onto the top of this possible mott. Um, and we've not been confined to um, sites and buildings either. So um, we've been looking at, um, at recording uh, or making high resolution records of, of um, carved stones, like and this, this example at the Kilmori stone, which is at Kirkham uh, in the northern part of the Rins. <clears throat> and again, um, for those of you that may have visited this stone, it's not the easiest thing to see. It's quite weathered and it has a lot of lichen on it. Um, and like many carved stones, um, you know, if you visit on a sort of dull, flat, overcast day, it can be difficult to pick out the details there. Um, so this three-dimensional model where we're able to um, extract the sort of topography of the surface of that stone uh, and take away the colouring um, caused by the, the lichen and weathering of the, the stone surface really enhances the, um, the carvings and gives uh, the visitor a much better appreciation um, of what's uh, depicted on that stone. So that's a really important um, uh, example of um, sort of uh, Scandinavian influenced um, uh, carved stone iconography in, in Dumfries and Galloway, really sort of significant piece uh, and really, I think, enhanced by this three dimensional recording technique. And all of this stuff that we've been doing, both with the Mackers groups and uh, on the RINs, is all designed to kind of help um, convey the importance of the archaeology of the area um, and get it out to as wide an audience as possible. So as much as we can get online, we have, um, and both projects have, have websites where you can, um, you can look at the results of these surveys and find out more about these sites. And I'd uh, recommend that you go to the DG Trails um, website to find out more about our work on the, the RINs Reveal project, which is ongoing. And yeah, I think I better stop there. So thank you. Hello. Hi. Well, that was that was great. It was really, really, really interesting on both sides and quite different kind of, um, you know, technology kind of used on both. But yeah, really, really interesting. 
And uh, Naomi, do you want to start with the first question? Yep, um, we've got a couple of questions uh, popped up on the Q&A, um, but if people have any more, um, just, just pop them into the, the Q&A at the bottom. I've got a couple of questions as well. Um, so the first one um, we've got is from Anne. Um, hello, Anne. Um, around about the medieval fish traps, or the fish traps, which we think may be medieval, but may, we're not sure, um, which are on the shore off Marlborough, which is um, between Silith and Allenby, um, right on the coast. Um, so Anne's asked, um, what techniques could you use to investigate them further? So she's also pointed out that we've got aerial drone photographs and photographs at shore level. Would there be some way of dating the structures? Um, would there be a chance of some, you know, um, if there's some, might there be a chance of wooden structures being found too? What What do you think, Mark? Because I think I think you know the um, the site. Have you got any thoughts? Yeah. I am. Um, um, yeah, I haven't been out to look at them yet, I'm afraid, but um, I will. Um, I did talk to Historic England about it a bit, and there could certainly be more recording we could do. Um, and yeah, in terms of dating, if there are timber elements, it's possible. I don't know if there'd be any timber big enough for, for dendrochronology, but um, carbon dating could be an option. Um, we'd, we'd have to really, I suppose, have a concerted survey. Um, may, maybe using some of the techniques Graham's mentioned, which we haven't used so much, but photogrammetry. Um, th this intertidal archaeology is actually something we haven't done a lot of on the, the Cumbrian side. Uh, but it is something we're wanting to start doing more in this cross-border project. So um, features like the fish traps would, would be on that in that project. I think that would probably have to be top of the list um, <laughs> um, for our, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, our cross-border project. So um, thanks for that, Anne. I think that's going to be another um, bit of a mystery, really, isn't it? I'd like to know a bit more about that as well. So um, do you want to do the next one, Claire? Yeah, so there's another couple of questions from Mark, but actually I'm going to be really cheeky and come in with one of mine for Graham. Um, so <laughs> LIDAR seems to be a real kind of game changer, actually, in the whole kind of archaeology field. But I was just kind of wondering how you were saying, obviously, it can work underwater as well. So does that open up the kind of coastal areas for us to be able to see things in the Solway that perhaps are slightly off coast in the marine environment? And I'm thinking of things like, you know, maybe wrecks that have been covered by sediment and, you know, other features because of kind of, um, you know, obviously sea level changes. Is that possible? Um, yeah, I, sh I should probably clarify that it doesn't work very well in water. So uh, um, the the sites that I was talking about when I was talking about um, surveying locks and things, were, those were all islands that were sticking above the above the waterline. And um, the problem with lidar is that um, it's done by uh, pulsing a laser beam to take these measurements, and when it passes into water, the laser beam just scatters. Um, and so. It's, I, I'm, I'm hesitating because you can sometimes get some data from shallow water when it's very clear and it's not too bad. And um, but for the most part, water isn't great. Um, but having said that, the intertidal zone is interesting because depending on when the survey was done, if the tide was out, for example, then you know you, it it does pick up quite a lot of features in that in that intertidal area. Um, so it's always worth looking at it. And yeah, I mean, in principle. If the data is there for the area you're interested in, that's the way to do it. Because, yeah, trudging around in the Solway silts <laughs> is difficult. You know, from a survey point of view, it's very difficult to um, to accurately locate things if you can identify them in the first place. So, yeah, doing them from doing it from the air is definitely the way to go. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, I'll do the next next one is actually um, I'm kind of pleased that the person's asked this question and um, another another arm here um, because when Graham um, popped up his logos at the end it did remind me that actually none of this would have been possible really a lot of these projects um, um, are externally funded um, so um, Anne's asked um, I just wondered how these projects are funded um, is there any funding available to support a new community archaeology project? And um, she's thinking about the Roman Vicus at Maryport linking with Hadrian's Wall 1900 Festival, which is next year in 2022. And there was various things uh, planned, events planned for that. Um, we um, obviously, um, with the home culture um, work, that's all pretty much all been lottery funded. Um, so that's been absolutely great. So but there are obviously other sources of funding as well. Um, Question really for both Mark and Graham. I don't know who wants to shout first. 
Um, okay. Um, yeah, lock, lottery funding, as as Naomi says, is is has been crucial to to all of the community work I've shown there. Um, and lottery have been very supportive, and they've allowed us to to develop and to write new projects, which further explore new discoveries and um, community engagement is absolutely key to that process as well. Uh, but lottery funding is competitive and um, can be quite hard to get, obviously. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think of any other, um, we, we have match funded in the past, we've match funded European funding with, with lottery funding. Um, so there was European money in a, in a lot of that as well, but that's not available anymore. Um, yeah, I think, as you say, Mark, almost all of these projects are involve a kind of patchwork of funding sources, don't they? I mean, the lottery quite often will take a chunk, or quite often the biggest chunk, but they'll still look for match funding sources um, from other other organisations. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a bit of a challenge, but the funding is there. Um, so for good projects, there will always be funding is our experience, yeah. Yeah, it is always an issue funding, isn't it? But like I say, hopefully we can get something going on a really good cross-border project. Uh, moving on to the next question, Nick ha is asking you, Mark, do you think that the red sandstone at the Abbey might have come from Red Kirk Point near Gretna? Um, it may have done, because the, the honest answer is we don't know where um, in the initial phases, the, the red sandstone did come from. We've, we've talked about doing some petrological analysis to try and identify the, the source of the red sandstone. It, it's never been tried. Uh, one response I got years ago when discussing it with a geologist was that the, he wasn't sure, because the red sandstone bed is so extensive, um, how to pin down exactly which part of, of that sandstone bed the stone came from. We do know that the monastery later was granted a, a quarry at West, near West Newton um, in Cumbria, but that's not the original source of the stone. Um, some antiquarian references, interestingly, um, if I remember rightly, sandstone chippings were observed at points along the River Waver. So it was proposed quite early on that, that the stone was brought in by the sea and up the Waver. Um, and of course, now we have the wharf at, at the Abbey, that's very likely, but um, it may have come from Redkirk Point. We don't know. Thank you. Another archaeological mystery, um, as many of them. Uh, we've got a, it's a question in the chat as well, um, which Anna's just pointed out, um, which is one really, I think, for, for Graham. Um, the major ramparts at the Mole remind me of similar earthworks in Yorkshire. So, for example, the Danes Dyke on Flamborough Head. Has any work been undertaken to suggest they have a common purpose or origin? Um, so, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, Graham or Mark, for example. Uh, Mark uh, uh, might have some thoughts as well. Um, I, I don't believe anyone's tried to compare them directly, but it is is an interesting point. They're, they're, they're certainly odd earthworks um, for a number of reasons. I mean, they look superficially like any other ramparts that you would get on, you know, an Iron Age promontory fort. Um, but there's a there's a lot of things about them that don't really stack up. And <clears throat> when you start looking closely, they look, they're, they're certainly composite monuments, you know, so they're things that have been built on top of each other over, you know, several phases of construction. Um, also, there's, you know, there's things about them that, that don't make a lot of sense in terms of typical Iron Age uh, uh, building techniques, you know, so, um, so they cut across the contours, for example, which is unusual um, for Iron Age fortifications, they usually use the contours to accentuate, you know, the, um, the defensibility of the position, but, um, you know, there, there's uh, there's just so many questions about that site that I don't think, you know, there's lots of directions we could go with it. Um, there's certainly likely to be Iron Age um, comparisons to make elsewhere, um, but I suspect there's a lot more to it. And I think that there's probably early medieval activity there too. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge um, kind of a site. A hodgepodge is a good term for it. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I think, you know, it made me think when you were talking about, about that on the mull, it's such a well-known spot, isn't it? A beautiful landmark. But actually, it's another one that 
you know we could close some coastal archaeology that we could really do with just doing some more research so yeah that's that right yeah i mean there's a I'm, one for a project i'm convinced there's you know there's a really important site there with a really amazing mm -hmm. story to, to tell about you know the history of the southwest and we just don't know any of it at the moment so yeah it's a fascinating landmark isn't it it's pretty mm -hmm. iconic so um so, do you want to go claire yeah well so in the interest of balance i know there is another question for graham but i'm just going to ask mark one of my questions as well get in there <laughs> cheeky oh. um so say the wharf at in um, the home cultural abbey was that would that have been tidal right up to that point or was it like a a, a kind of a river system or would the sea have come so much further you know so much closer in those days that it would have been tidal up to there the tidal reach currently is is um to the the south of the abbey so the river waver has been actually it was diverted when they built the railway at abbey town as well um but it backs it backs up so the tidal reach is still around that point although the, the waver is now quite some distance away so you're standing in a field um where there is now no river whether and of course, we have the mill to consider as well, and the outflow of the stank, which was a body of water there. So the landscapes really, really changed around that that area. Whether the monastery actually cut a channel to come to the abbey from the waver, if it was closer, um, we're not sure. They may have done. I mean, monasteries did cut canals, and you know, in the Fens, for example, um, they were they were perfectly capable of. Of cutting canals but we're not sure at the moment we do want to do a little bit more work to to chase the the course of that channel um you saw how clearly it shows in the geophysics where we have it and how we found the wharf so we want to extend that survey beyond and see if we can pin down more of the route of, of the channel as it was in the medieval period great thank you um, I've got. I'm going to throw one of my sneaky questions, and I know Nick's got another little question I'm getting before him. Um, and it's a. Uh, it's really just to both of you, really. So what? Um, what's been? You've obviously had. You know, the, the things you've featured have been just so interesting, and they're obviously all sort of momentous discoveries or, or something that we've really sort of learned a lot from. But what's been your most? If you had to choose one, what's been your most momentous archaeological discovery on the north or south side of the Solway? Or um, and also, what archaeological mystery would you most like to solve in the future? So it's double-ended. Hey, two, two sneaky questions in one there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to go first? I'll let you go first, Mark. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were about finished. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll save that role. Oh, it's all that. <laughs> oh, uh, um, momentous discovery. I don't I, I think the... the Having worked at Abitam for so long and sought to really understand how the, the monastery functioned in the landscape, how it utilised the landscape, I think that light bulb moment of the wharf is definitely probably definitely the, 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 the discovery in that project, yeah. Are you Graham? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, obviously surveys might thing by and large um, and you know just the the availability of the lidar over the past few years has really been amazing you know and and some of the sites that have come out you know that fort that i drew attention to in my talk that you know that should have been found years ago <laughs> it's huge and it has um you know big upstanding ramparts that that should have been recorded you know someone should have spotted that so you know the fact that we're still finding sites like that um you know, in, in the landscape that's well known, you know, it's right next to a path where people walk their dogs, you know, um, and, you know, just had completely escaped detection. So, you know, that and the hundreds of hut circles that are turning up left, right and centre, you know, just people are walking over every day. Um, you know, this, it's, it, as you said earlier, Naomi, it's a, it's a bit of a game changer. It's, um, you know, just all this new amount of information that's coming through is really exciting stuff. So, okay, second part of the question then. <laughs> well, okay, look to the future then. What is the archaeological mystery you both you'd sort of um, most like to solve on the Solway? Um, I think that there's not been enough work done on the context of, you know, the early Christian archaeology in, in the Southwest and the, you know, the, the Whithorn period when, 
you know, th th there's an argument for saying that, that Whitshorn was one of the sort of center points in Northern Europe. <laughs> you know, there was people coming from all over um, Europe and and further afield, you know, to, to get to Whithorn at one stage. Um, and, you know, in the sort of second half of the first millennium AD, you know, there's a few centuries where, you know, that it was one of the points where people were converging um, on. And, you know, we just don't know enough about the contemporary landscape. You know, the other, the other ecclesiastical sites, the other settlements that were in use, you know, the ports that were trading with, you know, the, the wider world. You know, we just, we don't have a handle on any of that stuff at all. So, you know, I'd really like to see more work done on that. Yeah, that's a fair point. What about you, Mark? I would like to find a Cranog in Cumbria. <laughs> <laughs> but actually quite serious, I, I think it's entirely possible that there's an early map which shows um, Anthorn, uh, where, the, where the airfield was built to Anthorn was a, was a lake or a tarn, and it shows three islands um, there, uh, which do look suspicious. And, you know, I've discussed with a few people, why don't we have Cranogs in Cumbria? So it was a very wet area. The Solway Plain was very wet, now heavily drained. I think if we had access to high resolution LIDAR data, as, as Graham's been showing, I think we would have similar levels of discovery. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot still to understand, but Cranogs, just one of many possibilities. Mm. Do you want to explain what a Cranog is, just for anybody who might not know? Oh, sorry, it's, a, it's an artificial <laughs> island in a, in a lake or a loch. Um, they exist in Ireland, in Scotland, a couple in Wales. Um, but when you look at the distribution map of, of these features, you know, people living in, in adapted to wet areas, um, why do they stop at the border? No, it's, it's very peculiar, isn't it? Because Dumfries and Galloway is one of the, the areas where they're found in their greatest numbers, and even in Dumfriesshire. And then you go a few miles over the border and they're gone. <laughs> yeah. It's very strange. Um, I think I'm with you, though, Mark. I think they must be there, or there'll be some. We just haven't found them yet. Yeah. Are they actually all man-made, as in that? Because I'm just thinking um, about, obviously, you know, big sort of lumps and bumps in the boggy areas like Roger Scuff and some of the other sort of higher points that are all mineral soils in PT land. And they're obviously not artificial, but they're obviously, they ha they've had for a long time settlements and farms on them. Um, but that's not to, you know, I assume a Cranog is totally artificial and um, sort of island. Um, so. Yeah. So why not? I mean, you know, we, yeah. we, have, we have settlement sites in England on wetlands. You know, the Glastonbury Lake Village, for example, is, is, a, is a cracking example. Uh, and the Solway Plain on the Cumbrian side was very wet. You know, plenty of bodies of water um, now drained. But I think we just have to look. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next question, which was one that next second question, which was to Graham was whereabouts can you find that information on LIDAR about the sites on the Machers? Yeah, I tried to answer Nick in the chat and I realised I answered the wrong question. So I've, <laughs> I've pasted in a URL to the, the Whithorn Trust website where the there's an interactive map that you can look at. Um, okay, so other people might be interested in that as well. Yeah, so. well, I'll try and do it again in the chat. So Thank you. Like, okay, I'll just put it in the general chat. Um, uh, and I've done that wrong as well. So <laughs> everyone, that's what I need to do. Okay, finally, that's it. Right, so oh, okay. there's a, a link in the chat now. Um, uh, but the map uh, was put together at the start of the project and it's not been updated yet with the results, so that'll happen soon. But you can still look at the data and you can see what, what people were exploring on that project. So, yeah, I recommend having a look. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we have got another another question just popped up um, and uh, just in the chat here as well. Um, and thanks, Graham, for posting that link as well. And um, are cup and ring marked stones as common on the Cumberland side as they are here in Galloway? So, what do you think? No, not that we know of. Um, there, of course, there are cup mark stones, cup and rings in Cumbria. Um, I'm trying to think of any substantial ones in on anywhere near the coast. I think that I think Senhouse Museum have have some, mm -hmm. um, or at least one in their collection. There are quite a few sort of portable examples. Tully House, I think, have some cumberland yeah. mark stones. We've seen some of them as well, so awesome. 
and certainly cut marks associated with sort of stone circles, you know, but not not nearly as as frequent as. You know, it's obviously a lot in Northumberland as well, aren't there? That's the other thing. There's an awful lot of them in sort of North Northumberland too, aren't there? So interesting. Okay. Another mystery. <laughs> So that's all, that's all the questions that are in the Q&A in the chat. I don't know whether you've got any other questions, Naomi. No. Nope. <laughs> I, I managed to get two. two <laughs> <surprises>. <laughs> so I managed to get my now I'll get well. <laughs> So I just want to say a big thanks to the speakers. That was really, really interesting. And I think it's kind of really opened up lots of kind of, um, you know, possibilities for future work and, like I say, hopefully if we get a, a, a project going cross borders, lots of opportunities to kind of do lots of exploration. I'll pass over to you, Naomi. Yeah, just final words, really. Um, it's the first uh, webinar that we've had of this uh, winter season. Um, we won't probably won't have another one before Christmas, um, but we are planning our next webinar for after Christmas. Um, so uh, we haven't got the details for that as yet, um, but we will do. So keep an eye out on our website and on our Facebook and Twitter and on Solar Firth Partnerships as well. And um, so there'll be more coming. Um, you can, um, if you want to watch this one again, um, or if you missed any from last winter, because again, there's some good archaeological, historical um, topics do around salt and historic farms. You can watch them again on YouTube. Um, so there's a link um, on the Solway Coast AOB website um, to our YouTube uh, channel. And I think they're, still, they're on Solway Firth, Firth Partnerships as well, Claire, I think. Yeah. As well, so you can't miss it. <laughs> and then just we'd love your feedback as well. If you've got any thoughts about this talk or any ideas for future talks, um, you can reply to the email address that is sent through your link that was sent through um, to get onto this webinar, but also just to um, use uh, you know Facebook or Twitter um, or Instagram and just send us um, send us any, any of your thoughts there. Um, and finally, you know, again, big thanks from me. We hope you've enjoyed it. We certainly have. Um, and we'll see you after Christmas for the next of our webinars. Thanks very much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank have you. a safe journey. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take care. Thank you very much. Both thank of you. Bye. Good night. Bye.